Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, I think we've got a, we a very exciting program this particular period. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about the whole issue back east uh, and the, the whole the Missouri is, is, issue, if you will, in Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri. But again, uh, we're going to get into that. But what we, what I'd like to, the point I'd like to make at this point in time is that we're fortunate, if you will, to have someone that has been talking about race issues here in Oregon for the past four years and have been holding uh, basically not only just seminars but gatherings, if you will. Uh, here within the, within Oregon, more, more particularly here in the in the metro area, in at McMiniman, the well known uh, well known uh, place, if you will, here in the Portland Portland metropolitan area, but uh, she also has been on the, on the show also too, and I'm talking about Donna Maxi, and Donna is has, has quite a background, if you will, that really gives her, the, as far as I'm concerned, the authority to talk about this issue. Uh, here, uh, here, as far as the whole issue of race, she has this sort of thing to race talk, and, and we're going to spend a little bit more time for those of you who ha who don't know Donna and what race talk is all about. We're going to we will give her an opportunity to share with us as to how she got into this, uh, the whole issue of race talk, and why she's doing it, and what it brings to the table. And again, like I said, uh, we, we we're not going to spend too much time on the whole issue of uh, the in Ferguson in the St. Louis area. We're going to spend a little bit more time. And what about Oregon? And where are we in the whole issue of race here in the state of Oregon? So with that, let me introduce Donna. How are you doing, Donna? Great. Good, good, good. Thank great. you for yeah. having me on. Good, good, good. Hey, fantastic. Well, I think it'll be great. Uh, you know, we would like for you to, again, um, share with the audience about what is Race Talk, how you got there. And uh, you, you've, been doing, you've been doing this thing for about four years now. And, and talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, you were doing during that four years, some of the highlights, let's put it that way. Okay. And then, uh, and uh, and so I think that would be very interesting. If if time permits, we'll we'll uh, we'll take some calls. Okay. If not, we want to make sure you're given the opportunity to articulate All right. who and what we're doing here in Oregon. Okay. But what I will do initially, I will just recap for those of you who are maybe not familiar with the the whole issue uh, in Ferguson in St. Louis. Uh, but uh, just give you a little feel, feedback of what that is, and we'll probably answer a few questions. But and then we'll, what we'll do, we'll just jump right into um, uh, with Donna and, and and the Holy Shit Race Talk. And this is this is from the Oregonian today. You might want to pick a copy of it if you'd like. The Oregonian. It says development in Missouri. Okay, in Ferguson, a diverse group of protesters, many of them children, march peacefully Saturday as calm prevail for a fourth straight day in the St. Louis suburb where Michael Brown, 18 and black, was shot by white police officer Darren Wilson. Several community activists walked side by side with police officers in uniform as they walked down one of the main streets in Ferguson that had been filled with armored vehicles and officers in riot gear less than a week ago. I think some of the frustration is dying down because more information is coming out, said Alna Ramey, 25, a St. Louis resident who joined the march. I think there is more action going on. People are being more organized, and that is helping. In St. Louis, dozens of people gathered at a St. Louis pub rally on behalf of Wilson as an online fundraising drive for the officer surpassed $300,000. One fundraising website raised so much money in so few days that it was shut down and a second page was open with its donations being directed to a fund managed by the local Fraternal Order of Police Lodge. In a statement read aloud Saturday, one supporter who, who, when pressed for her name, said only, I am Darren Wilson, said, Our mission is to formally declare that we share the united belief that Officer Wilson's action on August 9 were warranted and justified, and he has our unwavering support. We believe that the evidence has and will continue to validate our position. Organizers of the rally said the proceeds would help relocate Wilson's family and support him because he was unlikely to be able to work on the streets of Ferguson again. It would also help him if he were to be indicted or sued, she said. A few counter-protesters showed up by the rally, but the two groups largely ignored each other. The investigation, 
its investigation. At the request of Ferguson Police, Brown's death is being investigated by St. Louis County Police. The FBI also has opened an investigation into possible civil rights violations. St. Louis County prosecutors last week convened a grand jury to begin hearing evidence in the case. Despite concerns among some in the community that the office would not be impartial because of District Attorney Bob McCulloch's ties to law enforcement. McCulloch's father, mother, and other relatives worked for St. Louis police, and his father was killed while responding to a call involving a black suspect. He has said he will not remove himself from the case. Again, many articles have been written about this particular issue, and more will be written, uh, will be written about this particular issue. Again, we will we'll give you sort of an update as time goes on. But like I said, we'll, I think we, what we want to do on this particular show, this is the first of a number of, of, of shows that we'd like to do on this particular issue, is to deal with the issue of race. And um, there, there, there's been other incidents uh, that I could talk to in regards that some that's similar, there were similar like this, the chokehold, here in the, in the Portland Metropolitan area, that was one. Uh, there was just a recent situation up in New York, again, it's in, about the chokehold and whatever. But my point is that there's a lot of stuff in the press aspect of it, and I can't I can't identify with all of it. I mean, but the fact of the matter is, uh, it is an issue. So, like I said, we want to spend the time talking about race talk uh, with Donna with Donna Maxey here uh, in the state of Oregon. Okay, with that, Donna, let's start off with first off, let's define the uh, race talk in your organization. Well, Race Talk's formal title is Race Talk's Uniting to, un to Break the Chains of Racism, okay. uh, an Opportunity to Dialogue. And that's what we do. We have, we, there are a number of places around town that have speakers that come and talk about issues dealing with race. But what we do differently is that the first hour we have either speakers, a panel, or, um, or a film. And then the second hour, we have small groups that are facilitated by people who are trained to lead discussions about race. And we sit and talk, discuss questions that talk about the topic that the speakers have uh, shared with us. So the, the questions that we have, usually anywhere from eight to 15 questions, are, are a guideline. Um, it's not a necessity to discuss those questions. The, the group can discuss it or not. But the idea is to give a, a uh, to kind of give a formulation for, for a discussion. Mm -hmm. So people seem to really like it. We've been very successful. Um, we started at Kennedy School back in 2011. And uh, in February 2011, they had, at that time, at that time we, had, we have 150 seats. We usually have, I'm not going to say, we, we usually have more people than the 150 seats. I'm mm -hmm. not going to say I don't want the uh, fire chief visiting. Mm -hmm. And at Jefferson High School, Kennedy is one, of, McMinimins is one of our sponsors, and then Jefferson High School, Portland Public Schools mm -hmm. Office of Equity um, under Lorenzo Poe is another sponsor. Mm -hmm. And we meet at Jefferson High School in the cafeteria. We're um, still kind of developing the audience for that, but we generally have, we're in the cafeteria, and we generally have anywhere from 25 to 75 people come to Jefferson. So if your audience is interested in definitely getting a seat, come to Jefferson. Now, I noticed that you picked that particular area because it's a more diverse area within the state of Oregon, uh, as far as population-wise for African Americans and uh, whites. I mean, you got the well, whole... Well, Kennedy School was a little less... Uh, protracted than that. Um, okay. Kennedy School is where McMinimins has a meeting place right. Uh, right. large yeah. enough to hold a crowd. Okay. And our first one, I think at first Tim Tim was Tim Hills, who's their historian, was quite surprised because our first one, he thought we might get 25 or yeah. maybe 50 mm -hmm. people and we mm -hmm. had 85 people mm -hmm. who showed up for the first one. Mm -hmm. He was stunned. And what he noticed was that that was the largest crowd mixed ethnic crowd that they had ever had hmm. at Kennedy School. And every time our crowd is usually about 67% white, 33% people of color, depending on who the speaker is and what the topic is. Mm -hmm. um, and what's amazing to me is that at every race talk, about one third to one half of the audience are first time attendees. 
we have some people who've been attending for for the the whole time. Mm -hmm. So it just varies back and forth. You know, people come in, drop in and out depending on the topic. Mm -hmm. What, what some of the topics that you were you, you were in discussion? Should well, you share some of it. Maybe highlight it. Okay, um, I'm a little prejudiced. I like okay. them all. Uh, the first year we talked basically about these are people of color 101. Um, most people of color know something about white people. Mm -hmm. White people know very little in general about people of color. They know what they hear from the news stations. They know what they hear from, see on videos uh, or, or, you know. And what, what I find amazing is that the people that I see in the movies mm -hmm. and in the videos don't resemble the people that I know. Hmm. Why is that? Um, in the videos, and this is one of the things that makes me very sad as a former educator, children are given the idea to believe that they have to wear grills, they have to wear their pants sagging halfway down to their knees, um, that they have to use the N-word, mm -hmm. that the N-word and MF are a great part of their, their vocabulary, that um, they don't speak standard English, that if you're speaking standard English, you're coming from, you know, you're trying to act like you're something else. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is a small segment of the community, and the part that I find so interesting is that the people who are doing that generally are not like that themselves privately. I happened to run into a rapper. Um, he was Master P. I happened to run into him. Okay. And, you know, if you see Master P, you, his image looks a little little gruff. Mm -hmm. I almost didn't recognize this guy. He, he seems, he was so gentle and warm and I thanked him for his appearance on, on Dancing with Stars and it was albeit brief and said what I really liked about him was that he produced his own records. Mm. He produced and he recorded, produced and distributed his own wow. records. So he's the first brother to do that and get his cut. And in fact, uh, following his lead, someone else uh, was had done that hawking their wares door to door, and the record company came to them and said, we'd like to sell your records. Um, and the brother said, okay, we'll take an 85-15 split. Okay. I get 85, you get 15. Mm. And the record company, usually, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. The record company gets 85 mm -hmm. and, and the uh, recording artist gets 15. So... Did they buy? Yeah, they did. Because he was, they, he was already successful. Okay. He was already successful. So they wanted a piece of that pie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They wanted a piece of that pie. Mm -hmm. and, and, and greed is an, is an interesting oh, yes. thing. It oh, will yes. make you do lots yes. of things. But I digressed, and so uh -huh. I'll get back to race talks. Um, we talk about everything. The first year, it was people of color. Um, the African American experience in Oregon, the Native American experience in Oregon, the Asian American experience in Oregon. And I find the Asian American experience very interesting as well as the Native American in a different sort of way. Um, African Americans are the newest ethnic group here in the United States. If you figure that we've been here maybe five or six hundred years mm -hmm. and we came from so many different other countries and they were blended together to be one group of people and when you consider what we have done as a culture in such a short time under such horribly adverse um, conditions with the United States having the worst form of slavery, the most brutal and inhumane form of slavery in history, in history. So uh, we've done very well. We're, we're exceedingly superstars on this. The Native American people um, what's so interesting about them is that the government, the United States government, decided to not recognize certain tribes. Mm -hmm. So there are people who are from tribes that aren't recognized. They, mm -hmm. it's, it's as though they don't exist. So there are, I think here in Oregon there are eight tribes, major tribes that are recognized, but there were many more tribes that were here. So um, this next month, September 2nd, we're having three women across generations come and speak about their experience as Native women here in, in Oregon and what the difference has been for them, you know, from generation to generation, an elder, uh, a middle-aged woman, and a younger woman in her 20s. And then... Um, 
at McMinniman's Kennedy School this next month, we're talking about the driver's license issue. Um, whether people should, CASA is an organization that is supporting um, a measure, an initiative on the ballot that talks about getting driver's license into the hands of people who are not citizens. Mm -hmm. So we're having both sides, people who are pro and con on the initiative come mm -hmm. and talk about what, what their opinions are on it. It's not a debate. This is purely informational. If somebody wants a debate, they can go somewhere else, mm -hmm. but we're just mm -hmm. having it for informational purposes. Um, some of the other programs we have at Race Talks are, oh, oh and I mentioned the Asian American. This is so interesting, Polo Catalani, who was one of our speakers when we, had that, when we had that topic, pointed out so beautifully that all of these people sitting here are now called Asians, and before we came to the United States, we didn't know what an Asian was, <laughs> because they, they weren't Asian. Mm -hmm. They belonged to their own, they were people from their own country. Mm -hmm. And um, Anita Shah was, um, was one of the speakers. She's uh, from India. And I laughed because in my lifetime, Eastern Indians have gone from being called Caucasian to being called um, Easterners, and now they're, they're Asians. So, you know, I don't know. They're the same people they were when I was born, mm -hmm. but they've got all these different designations here in the United States. So um, a lot of defining of who you are mm -hmm. is done by the mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. um, so we talk at Race Talks about the ethnic groups. Then we've had, we had a great one um, that talked about race, are we really so different? And we invited OMSI to come. We us usually on a panel, unless it's about an ethnic, particular ethnic group, we usually have uh, someone who's a college professor mm -hmm. who studies the particular field and can talk about what the issues are. We have a person who works in the field, and then we have people who are involved in it personally. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a multifaceted view of what the issue is from someone who may or may not be involved. Frequently, the professors are white, um, not always. And then other times, you know, we might just have all people telling their story. So it's it's very interesting. We've had race in the arts. Uh, we had three groups: um, Bobby Father, um, the Milagro Theater, um, and the the drums, the Tycho drums. Tycho Portland came and spoke, and also the director of RAC, the uh, Regional Arts Council, came and spoke about race and the arts. We've talked about health issues. We had a, a presentation about fluoride, and some people came to me and said, we need to talk about this. There, race is involved with this fluoride issue. Hmm. I had no idea. Hmm. that there were ramifications for people of color hmm. in terms of fluoride. But they presented, a, a, they presented quite the compelling case. Hmm. Hmm. So, um, and this next year, we're going to be looking at, in, in November, we're looking at race in the workplace. Um, we're also going to be, we're having our fundraiser. Okay. in October, and I'll talk about that okay. more later. Um, then next year, we're going to have a topic, one of them is cross-cultural adoption. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I have a couple of people who were adopted cross-culturally, an Asian man adopted by a white family, a woman who is was adopted, and she's not sure what her ethnicity is. She thinks she's Latina and maybe Asian or Indian and was adopted by a Jewish family. Okay. And then I ran across this woman in Costco. I'm hawking speakers everywhere I can. I saw this woman and, and white woman, and she had a little black child. And I said, is that your child? And she said, yes. And I said, I want you to speak. <laughs> Just like that. I want you to speak. She, accepted. she did. She said she would. So uh, she says, oh, I thought you wanted me to come and listen. Oh, no, I want you to talk. So um, so I'm hawking speakers everywhere I can and, and trying to 
to raise the awareness about how race is involved. Um, we haven't done anything with racism in terms of, and racism and race are two different things. Yeah, yeah, let's like, define it for us, help us out a little bit on that. Well, the two. Actually, there's one race. Okay, all right. The human race. Okay. And the rest of the people are, are cultures and ethnic groups mm -hmm. that are a part of that human race. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason, that, the reason that it is one race and one species is because when you get, when you have in the, in the animal kingdom, and we are human animals, mm -hmm. um, if you mix across species, then generally they do, it doesn't take and you don't produce an offspring. One of the rare cases that you do is in the case of, uh, of a mule and a horse, mm -hmm. of a donkey and a horse. Then you mm -hmm. get a mule, mm -hmm. but the mule is sterile. Mm -hmm. And if you look at human beings, pretty much people who are, who are mixed, gee whiz, they can still procreate. Yes, that's right. So that's they right. are all part of the same species. Mm -hmm. um, so racism is an interesting topic. And it's a man, race, just like race is a man-made mm -hmm. Think phenomena, racism is a man-made phenomena. And um, the definition of racism here in the United States is when you have a system, when you're a person of that rep is represented by the system mm -hmm. and it supports you. So when you act as that person that the system is in support of you, then what you're doing is being racist. In your system, actions. Define system. Well, Wait, your the social system here in this country. Okay. Uh, the social system, the, the dominant group in our social system in this country is um, Caucasian. Mm -hmm. So when a white person does something, they might do the same thing that a person of color does, but the person of color doesn't have a system that backs them mm -hmm. up, that supports them in quite the same way. And so... I, if I do it, I'm being biased or prejudiced. I don't have, as an African-American woman, I don't have the power of a system to back me up. Whereas if I were a white woman and I did the same thing, then I have the power of that system to back me up. So it has far, far more um, far-reaching consequences for what occurs than it does for a person who does not have the power of the system. And I had a white person who asked me about this and said, so how can't you be racist? And I said, well, if we lived in a country where all of the people primarily look like me and the government, the people in the government look like me and I discriminated against you, then I would be being racist. Do they recognize that? That's a hard concept to understand. Um, it's kind of like white privilege. Most white people don't realize that they have privilege. That's like asking a fish, how's the water? Fish don't realize they're in water. They've always been in it. And um, they don't understand that it's any different. They just think it's the same for everybody else because they see everybody swimming. But um, here in this country, it's, it's very difficult. And, and it's not to say that white people don't work hard because they do. They work very hard. But it's like running a 100 meter foot race Poor white people start at zero, all the way up to the Rothschilds at plus 97. Mm -hmm. And people of color start behind that zero mark and go back to African Americans at minus 50. And I say African Americans at minus 50 because we are the most maligned group of people in this country. I mean, people who just come to this country have an opinion about African Americans and treat us accordingly. Mm -hmm. And I've had a few people who have admitted it. Once they got to know me, they admitted, yeah, I had heard negative things and I thought all black people were like this and da-da-da-da-da. The things they've heard in the news, the things they've seen in the movies. But those movies are, are not generally written, produced, or distributed by African Americans. Mm -hmm. Those movies are distributed by the white power structure. So it's a whole different how... I view your actions and how you view your actions are two different things. And how you would portray them to someone else 
is another thing. You know, there's always been this discussion, a question from a number of African Americans or black Americans or colored people or whatever as to as to who they are. You know, am I an African? I'm not from Africa. Uh, I was sold as a slave by African chiefs or whatever, and then I get here to America and I build this country. Am I not an American? Uh, what, 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 there's this, this discussion, you know, because we went through these various cultures of initially, well, you're black, or you, or you, or you in. Uh, we went through several of these. How do, how do, how do you address that issue? Have you, has has that been a discussion in some of your in some of your topics? No, um, I I don't think how you how one calls oneself is that important. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I personally define myself as being descendant okay. of the kings and queens of Africa. Okay. And of slaves here in America, and uh, some people have pointed out to me that my people weren't slaves; they were enslaved. 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 Okay. E N slaved. Okay enslaved. And so um, I am very proud of both groups. Mm -hmm. And I had a person once ask me, are you really descendant of, of kings and queens? And I said, well, let me put it this way. I don't know exactly whom I, who I'm descendant from, who my ancestors were. So I get to choose. And since I get to choose, why would I pick the bums? <laughs> That's so, good. I so I, I I choose the kings and queens, mm -hmm. and um, and the people who came here, that were supposed to be ignorant mm -hmm. and have no knowledge, but came and worked the fields, grew the crops, built the White House, and most of all the other buildings in this country in the early years and the railroads, all those people not knowing how to at first talk to each other because they came from different countries and different tribes, not knowing how to read, not knowing how to write, and still they rise, and still they rise. Phenomenal people. But why is that so? I mean, well, well, I mean you, you, like I said, you've gone this thing four years. You've been talking about people of color. You've had this diverse group. If we are, uh, is that majority group learning what, you, what we're talking about here? Are they I think I think a lot of people are. I think um, one of the things that that I found so interesting. I've had white people who have told me this is the first time that I've ever talked about race and felt comfortable asking questions. That I've talked about it with a person of color and felt comfortable asking questions and not afraid that I was making you know putting my foot in my mouth. And as I like to tell people, you will put your foot in your mouth, mm -hmm. and I do it. We all will do it. Um, the whole purpose of having a facilitator is so that when you put your foot in your mouth, they help you take it out, and when the and, and to keep other people from putting their foot somewhere else on you. So, oh, so you know, um, and I've had people of color who have told me this is the first time I ever told a white person how I really feel about racial mm -hmm. issues. So I, I think there's a and the evaluations bear out that people enjoy the discussions, that it's informative, that they want more of it, that they're interested in learning about it. There's thirst for it. Um, you know, we have capacity crowds at Kennedy School. Wow. And uh, over capacity, I should wow. say. Let, wow. me, let me just say capacity. I, wow. I don't want to say that too loud. But, um, and we're growing. Good. And Good. so Good. the plan is to keep enlarging race talks and hopefully we will take it um, statewide and maybe um, Interstate. Well, sounds good. In fact, we're, we're going to take it statewide in this next half hour, too. Okay. That's fair? Okay, that sounds fine. good. We're going, to take, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Donna and talking about race talk. Yeah. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Welcome back, folks. Again, uh, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here at the Oregon Voters Digest, and our guest today is, we're, we're fortunate to have her, Ms. Donna, Donna Maxey of Race Talk. And boy, this has been just great. I mean, that, I mean, th that first 30 minutes was, as far as I was concerned, was an intro, if you will, of the, the, the good work that she's been doing over the last four years. We could do more and more of this, so right up front with you, we wanted to just spend some time on Ferguson and uh, and talk about that particular issue, and we probably want to see if we can open up the lines. So what, what we've decided now is that uh, we're going to probably have her come back on, and we'll continue maybe to, to talk about some of the things that she's doing uh, in the community and in the state of Oregon. And, uh, and you can look at some of her shows, by the way, on YouTube. Right. They're, they're on YouTube, so if you want to catch up on some of the other <coughs> But on the others, you know, we're, we're going to have her on and maybe just highlight some of the things uh, that she plans on doing and have her come back onto the show and, and basically entertain you, too. Okay, fine. Well, well Donna, I'll tell you what, uh, as a result of that, why don't, we, um, why don't we talk about the Ferguson issue aspect of it? What, what do you think when you... Uh, well, Ferguson is just the tip of the iceberg. And... When you look at an iceberg, one-tenth shows and nine-tenths doesn't show. And I was reading an article here in the, um, in the scanner, and it had some alarming statistics. It talked about young men who had been killed by police who were unarmed, African-American males. And it seems like it's open season hmm. on black males. Mm -hmm. And that's nothing new. Um, why African Americans are so maligned in this country, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure I understand. I mean, I haven't found anyone who, mm -hmm. who has explained it to me. Um, I was reading something recently about a police officer who said that he was afraid of black people and that whenever he had a, a call that came in for black people, that it was in the black part of town, then he would be busy. Hmm. And he, they'd ha he'd pass the call off to someone else. And I found that interesting. But what was most interesting was that his father, when he was a child, would tell him if he didn't behave, he was going to take him over to in town hmm. and, the, and the things, the horrible things that the black people would do to him. Hmm. So he grew up with this fear hmm. of black people, but had never been around them. Hmm. And a fear that lived on in his heart as a, as a police officer. And I just recently at Race Talks, um, this last, it, well, this earlier this month in August, we had a program that was sponsored, um, co-sponsored by the S Police Citizens Review Committee. Hmm. And that is a citizens committee that reviews uh, things with the Portland Police Bureau. Okay. So uh, Irene Konef is the uh, person who is the staff person for that com commission. And we asked a number of questions. We, the, the main issue was, are, is the, are the police diverse enough here in Portland? And do we have good community policing? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these shootings would be eliminated with those two things if they were done mm -hmm. properly. Mm -hmm. Number one, have officers in the community that look like the people who are in that community mm -hmm. and also that know the people in that community. The other thing is to have community policing. Um, they showed a clip from uh, someplace back east in Ohio, I think it was, that had won an award for community policing. And they showed a clip from the movie, um, oh, the, the, not the rail, I forget the name of it, some, mm -hmm. something about police. Mm -hmm. I've never seen the movie, it's on HBO. And it, it's a program that talks, and, and a woman was talking about the policeman. She said, there was a white policeman that came by, and he came and introduced himself to my mother, and he stood and talked to her and sat on her mm -hmm. porch, and he talked to all the people who went by, and he came back and talked to my mother on a regular basis. And um, the police officer who was leading the meeting wanted to hurry on. She says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not finished talking. Mm. You know, you need to hear this because we need more of that. Mm. And I agree with it. I remember um, back in the 80s, there was a policeman, Jim Coslin, who would come and talk to my father. My folks had a mom and pop grocery store. And he would come by all the time 
and just talk to my dad, meet people who were in the community, um, find out what was going on in the community, kind of walk up and down the street a little bit. Um, when Rosie Sizer was made police chief, I was on the Human Rights Commission at that time, and I was, it was after, shortly after I'd gone on, it was after meeting, she was standing there waiting to talk to me, and I thought, okay, I think she's waiting to talk to me. I wasn't quite sure. I didn't know her. And so she said, are you Mr. Maxie's daughter? And I said, yes. And I, I think it's funny because his first name is Mr. Yeah. And because um, nobody knew his first name. And, um, and so she said, you know, I really miss your father. And he helped to break me in when I was a new cop. He was tough and he kicked my butt you know, tell, helping me learn the ropes of how to deal with the community and how mm -hmm. to get along with people. But he did a great job of that. And that's what we need. We need mm -hmm. more community policing. It's hard. It's easy to kill someone that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And if you already come with the fear of a group of people and you have a gun, mm -hmm. then that gives you a defense. I re remember walking through Costco and seeing an officer coming out of Costco. Now, he's just walking out of Costco. It was a young white guy. He has his hand on his gun. Hmm. And I'm thinking, why do you have your hand on your gun? You asked him that? No, I didn't ask. Yeah. I just looked at him. I just watched him walk by. I thought, why is your hand on your gun? Why hmm. are you at the ready? Hmm. Hmm. You know? And, and it might be a place to rest it. But he didn't have his other hand on his uh, on the on the holster on the other mm -hmm. side. He had it on his gun. Yeah. It, hmm. I think that um, that there are a number of people who become policemen. I think the the same thing that happens with uh, teaching is people who get into the police. Either it's a calling, something that they decided to do as a young child mm -hmm. because they wanted to help changed the community and, and they, they had a good experience with the police as a child or, or they saw the police as being someone brave and strong. And then there are people who were not, who were picked on, mm -hmm. who decide they want to become policemen. Mm -hmm. And so they become policemen because now I got a gun. Mm -hmm. You and, know, let's go back to that point in regards to the community. That's very important. But the person that comes to mind uh, from my experience here in the Portland Metro area, was Harry Jackson mm -hmm. and his sister, and I think his son also was known, but but Harry more particular. He was the only guy that I knew, police officer. There was others, there were others, but Harry felt very comfortable driving alone in the car, 24/7, anytime, anywhere in the community. Bottom line, he had the background. He grew up with a lot of these folks, and he was a local aspect of it. That was very very effective. And, uh, and so the idea was, by the way, I was going to ask you the question, was Harry ever given the opportunity to come in and meet the group to kind of share his experience and why he was so successful in doing what he was doing? We haven't talked about that, and that sounds like a panel that we need to have this next year about the actual art of policing. Yeah. Because there's an art to everything. Oh, it is. It is. Even if you're collating papers, yeah. there's an art to getting it yeah. done. And so I think that that's, that's a great topic. And Harry is one that I will yeah. ask to come. And then there's a Captain Smith that I knew at purpose. In fact, he was, a, he, was, he was one of the major factors in putting getting more African Americans on the police force. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, really, we, they used to call them rent -a cops and whatever, but the bottom line is that he was very active in getting folks he was this white guy, a captain, if you will. But again, he was the kind of guy, again, that basically said to those other officers, get out of your cars. Mm -hmm. Get out of your cars. Go play some basketball with some of the kids out there playing hoops and this, that, and the other. That was actually going on during that particular time. Then there was a change. And, and that needs to happen. When I was a kid, the police would um, knew the kids. Right. And right. I think it needs to happen again. Right, right, right. Tell you what. Look like folks are wanting them. We said we're going to open up the lines. Is it okay? We can sure. do this now. Sure. Let's go on and open up the line at this point in time. Okay, your questioner. Questioner? Yes, please. Hello. hello. Do you hear us? Yes, Bruce. Uh, Bob. How you doing, Bob? Sorry you couldn't make it this time around. Yeah, I, I got in in time to, to. Are you there? Is Bob there? Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to put my TV on mute. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. So you, you uh, Donna, how are you doing? I'm fine, uh, thank you. Good. I I was listening to you as you began, and one of the questions that I came up with is uh, one of the things that I noticed in my travel is that uh, we see when we have a conference or a gathering, we want to talk about race as a group, not just a black group, but all people of color. But when Latinos or uh, uh, Indians or uh, Asian Americans or Pacific have their conference, they want to talk about their plight and what's going on with them. How do we get our young black men and women to understand that we need to have that conversation among ourselves about ourselves? As we, before we begin to include everybody else. Good. Am I right or good am point. I wrong? Good. Hey, good point. Donna, talk to us. What do okay. You say? Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think that we have to be talking about each group talking in their own, in their own ethnic group, uh, talking about their own issues. And the way you get that started is that two or three people get together and get started on it. It's not rocket science. It's not, um, you don't have to have any formal training. You just have to have an idea and then sit down and get started with it and bring other people on. If you, be if you belong to a church, you need a place to meet and you need a topic to discuss. And... And, and start it there. Um, one of the things that Bruce and I didn't discuss this time is how I got started with Race Talks. And right. it came out of working with Courageous Conversations in Race, which is about talking about race, period. Um, and so the topic of r Race Talks covers multiple ethnic groups. And when we do have uh, discussions, I try to include multiple ethnic groups because the idea behind that is that it will be more people of color by 2040 in the United States. And truth be told, we as people of color don't know each other. Mm -hmm. We know white people a little bit better than we know ourselves. And I, as an African-American woman, cannot speak for all African-American people and wouldn't dare try and wouldn't want anyone else speaking for me. So... Um, I think that you have a great idea. In fact, I was talking to someone the other night about that and making the suggestion that maybe we start with some of the organizations that are already here. And one of the people who has, is local um, that has written a fantastic book is Dr. Joy DeGruy. And she's written a, a book called The Post the post-traumatic slave syndrome okay. so i'm hoping that that you know we were talking yeah, about sure. he said you should have her on your program i said yeah. well my speakers aren't quite getting the the fee that she's getting so if mm -hmm. we had a um, multiple groups sponsoring this it would work and bob since you know bruce i'm going to hold you responsible yeah, so. for getting that started that getting that ball good. rolling that sounds good but bob, bob thank you very much buddy i'll see you I'll see you week after next. We'll talk but, about that. Yeah, you had another you're point. Quite welcome, you had, Bruce. You had, wait, by the way, you had another question. All right. You had another question. Okay. All well, right. I did, but I don't want to take up the entire oh, show. I good. know she'll be back, and I'll <laughs> be there. Yes, you will. Okay, fine. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that. Well, you know, uh, talking and just following up and getting the word out and trying to basically get folks to be quote uh, inclusive uh, and whatever. Uh, when I think about the media, I think about in medias like myself. You know, that's what we are doing. We're trying to educate. That's basically the format and the background of what I'm doing, bringing, bringing guests like yourself to educate people about what are the issues, and hopefully they can have those discussions. Then we have our, there are several, then there, there are newspapers of all the various colors. you got El Hispanic, you got the Asian Reporter, and then we got the black, black uh, media, you got the scanner, we got the observant aspect of it. Again, they too are trying to educate, if right. you will. But the fact of it is, you got to buy it. I mean, you at least pick it up. And that's in many cases, it's just free. Right. But but a lot of folks don't subscribe, 
And because no due respect, if you own a media like that, if you will, guess what? It costs money to put that that, that stuff out and just on the stand, if you will. So consequently, they have to pick up ads. And a lot of times, there's, there's a, the, 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 the majority community, if you will, respond to the fact, well, you're not getting out to... <laughs> To my folks, if you will, you got my point, and that there's a there's a very important piece. So, the the communities of those various cultures need to know that if you want that education, you need to actually get it. Well, you know that's what, an what interesting point that? that you're you raised. Um, I was asked by Trinity Episcopal Church to come and speak during during Black History Month in right. February, and they had a number of speakers that came, and I was kind of the cleanup hitter. And my challenge to them was to do something about racism other than during February. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, are they going to put this back on the shelf and then call me again in February right. of next year? Or are you going to do something on an active, proactive basis? And to their credit, they have formed a group. It was an excellent program that they put together, and mm -hmm. it was their first one. But uh, they formed a group called Train Trinity Race. I forget what all the things stand for. But I'm consulting with them, and they are getting social justice alerts from Race Talks. That's something we do. If you sign up, um, uh, get in touch with Race Talks at racetalks01 at gmail.com and say that you would like to receive our social alerts and be on the Race Talks mailing list, we can put you on yeah, there. Yes. Uh, so the folks at, at, that, at Trinity are getting the social alerts. Um, they also, I'm working with them on some s functions around town that involve ethnic groups, different ethnicities, and media that are for different ethnicities. So this is, a, it's starting slowly to, mm -hmm. to germinate and, and it will be blossoming as time goes along. And I think that, you know, we're, we're working on it. I'm working with um, uh, some folks and I won't say who mm -hmm. to, to work on a project about uh, the LGBTQ community mm -hmm. uh, of color. And um, so it, it takes time mm -hmm. for things to germinate. And for people to not to not be defensive, because this is not personal. This is telling a history. And, you know, just as I am not responsible for what my neighbor does or the person, you know, my family before me, you are not, if you are a white person, you are not responsible for what your ancestors did or what your parents did. But you are responsible for what you do. And you are responsible if you don't do something to change what's going on right now. And to the credit of the great, the folks that are at Trinity, that are at First Unitarian, I see a lot of things happening at those places. And I'd like to see it happening at other houses of worship and, and other social groups. Mm -hmm. And, and there have been a number of groups that have invited me to come and speak. But it's one thing to have someone speak. It's another thing to act. Mm -hmm. And, and at Trinity, the at the Trinity, issue. they're acting, and I like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that. Well, you know, again, on that, that same line, thinking about communication and getting the word out and getting folks to discuss these issues and getting to those various mediums that at least gives them the opportunity to talk to. Like I said, Ms. Senator, Bob and I were talking about this the other day. You know, we, we're right in the midst, if you will, of a gubernatorial election aspect of it. I noticed in the paper today that they had have, have announced, if you will, the debates. And they, they listed about four different debates, uh, and mo mostly in the metro area. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see one of the debates there that talked to basically talking to the issues that we're talking about here, race talk, something along that line. You know, from the standpoint of kind of like a little a gathering, if you will, maybe you get a, get the observer there, like a Bernie Foster uh, and someone from the observer aspect of it and someone from El Hispanic, someone from the Asian reporter. And then basically interviewing both of these candidates that are running for office, talking about, guess what, they don't necessarily have to say, well, let's talk about race. I mean, obviously, the, the, the panel that's going to be asking the questions are going to be obvious. They're going to respond to that. People do that anyway. You got me? But I don't see anything along that particular line. So my, I, I guess my, my point to you is that is that something that you think we should entertain doing within our, within our area? Absolutely. I mean, at the same time, let me say, that all of the issues that affect white people affect people of color in a greater way. And particularly if those people of color are lower socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. They bear the brunt 
of changes in a society. But why don't they get that? We've been doing it. We've been talking about this for years and years and years. And why don't they get that besides just calling one of us? If you will, and just sitting down with one message. You know, that's you know really that's really Talk funny. That's really funny that you say that because I remember when I first came back to town in 1985, and I was highly active. I was hyperactive in the teachers' yeah. association, and um, and I was working with the lobbyists for OEA. And one of them said, "Well, we want to hear what the black people's opinion is." Yeah. And I said, "There is no." He said that there's there's just so many people and we can't get their one opinion. And I said there is no one opinion. You know why do we why don't we just have one white opinion? He goes well yeah. the white community is diverse. And I said so is the African American yeah. community and every other community mm -hmm. of color. Mm -hmm. There is no one point of view. And I think what has happened in the past is that um, they. Folks get confused <laughs> with what happened in um, in the South with the bus boycotts and with voter registration. That was a one-issue campaign mm -hmm. that everyone could get behind. But all of the community did not have the same need in the same way. I mean, if you can't ride the bus, if you can't sit where you want on the bus, that, that affected everyone, whether you were a doctor or you were the bum in the gutter. If you couldn't vote, that affected everyone, whether you were, again, a doctor or a janitor. Mm -hmm. So those were issues that went across the community, but it affected each one in a different sort of way. If the, doc the doctor had his own car, it didn't matter to him as much. Whereas the person who was lower in socioeconomic and needed to ride the bus, that was a very real issue for them. So I think that's the same thing. I think um, they're looking for this homogenous yeah. point of view from a community of color, and it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in all due respect, I, I've got to make mention about what you just said about the fact that the, the last election aspect of it, and the, I, when I was running for that office aspect of it, it was kind of interesting. It was a, the four African Americans that were running at the same time, and, and the media just didn't know how to deal with it. They just did not know how to deal with it. They didn't want to talk to the issues. And they felt that, well, you know, hey, we just got one person. That's what we want to deal with. And it was just a sad note. But it, it was a very interesting. We can have that discussion at some other point in time aspect of it. But look, we got about, well, we got about eight more minutes. Okay, I want to talk about a points. couple of things um, that came, and this is back to Ferguson. Um, something that really kind of opened this up, uh, there was a young man, man named Alvin in New York City, and mm -hmm. I love it. On YouTube, please go to YouTube and look up effing mutt. Effing mutt. I mean, effing, you have to spell the word, right? Well, I think you can put effing, you know, F, blah, 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 G, uh, okay, okay. or you can write the word out, okay. but effing mutt. And F mutt effing mutt. Mutt, M U T. M U T T. Okay, M U T T. And it, it was a young man who had been harassed by the police mm -hmm. walking down the street and had been, within a two-block period, had been stopped twice. Hmm. And was doing nothing but walking down the street. And the police stopped him, and, oh, they were, the police be, talk about behaving poorly. But the difference was this time that he had his cell phone on. Hmm. And it was all tape recorded. Hmm. All tape recorded. So in New York City, they're kind of doing something a little bit less, but... It happened in 2011, didn't come out till 2012. But 87% of the stops in New York City were black and Latino, and most of them were male. And 90% of those people that they stopped were innocent. Hmm. So if 87% if of the stops are those people and 90% are innocent, that means that that's 72% of the population that's innocent. That means that the majority of the people who are doing the wrong things are white people. Hmm or other ethnicities included with the whites. and So, you know, we have to quit looking at an excuse and saying, well, you look suspicious. And that was one of the things that the police officer said to Alvin. You look suspicious. You were giving us suspicious looks because he looked at the police. Here's one here. You got that about was, two minutes, so push them. This was in the scanner. This was in the scanner, and it talked about um, how... At the since t between 2005 and 2012, nearly it says an unarmed African American died at the hands of an armed white police officer at the rate of nearly two per week. 
two mm -hmm. per week. And the part that's most amazing about that is that um, this is from 750 of the 17,000 law enforcement agencies in the country report these statistics to the mm -hmm. FBI. Mm -hmm. So those statistics are only from those 750 agencies that report it. Uh, what about the others? So what about the other thousand that don't report it? And it is happening wow. on a regular basis. Well, Donna, we got about a minute and a half at, at most. Why don't you just share some of the highlight, other things that you wanted to say. We're okay. going to have you back on. Okay. And I would also make note, in fact, you can look at Race Talk on YouTube right. and catch up on a lot of the stuff that we, we've already discussed or, and other things or whatever. Okay, go on and talk. You can type in McMiniman's Race Talks um, and it'll come up on YouTube. In, um, again, September 2nd at Jefferson High School Good. from 7 to 9, we'll have a Race Talks, uh, the Native American Women Speak. Um, and then at September 9th at McMiniman's Kennedy School from 7 to 9, we will, in the gym, we will have um, the topic of uh, the driver's license for people yeah. who are non-citizens. In October, um, at Jefferson High School, we're having a social and we'll be giving away prizes for folk, to folks coming. We want people to get together and yeah. talk, so it'll yeah. be prizes for people to get yeah. together and, and get to know each other. And then at McMiniman's Kennedy School, we're going to have our fundraiser and we're going to have a silent auction. So we had some great Steve. prizes. Yes. Great, great prizes, yeah. you know, beach getaway, yeah. wine, yeah. 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 pictures, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. original pictures, everything. Yeah. So come. We'd love to have you. Is there an address or a number that they can call um, you with you? got about six, 15 seconds. You Talk can call me. me, Donna Maxey, at 971-222-8254, or you can get in touch with us at Race Talks, with an S on the end of the talk, 01 at gmail.com. Donna, we'll look forward to seeing you. Good. Donna, thank you very much. We're thank you for you having here me. For this next series. Okay. Thanks again. Folks, thank you very much. Enjoy your enjoy this, this upcoming holiday, if you will, Labor Day, and uh, I will see you week after next, okay? Have a good one. Take care. Bruce Bouchard here. And Donna, thanks again. Thank Always you. Always a pleasure.